everyone, welcome. Uh, we have the pleasure today of hosting Mr. Michal Budolinski. Uh, once again, because we've already hosted him uh, this year, last time he gave a talk about Batman, this a time we will talk about Superman, and uh, it will be, the title of the lecture will be Superman, Twilight of the American God. Uh, what we value very much in what Mr. Budolinski presents us is that we not only hear about comic books or about superheroes, but we hear a lot about psychology, philosophy, sociology, political science, how all that is combined, how we can all see that and see American culture and different aspects of it reflected in comic books, which is something which we do here, something which we value uh, very much. That's why we've invited him again, and we um, gladly accepted the topic uh, which we think will be very interesting for you to hear. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. Budolis. anniversary of creating uh, Superman and uh, first of all before we start uh, I want to thank um, Eva Fabian and Clementina Dance uh, everyone can hear me okay uh, for uh, for the help in translating my uh, article uh, which was originally uh, published uh, in Canadian uh, portal named Pop Mythologist. After this lecture, uh, there will be a record of this lecture, and you will find this article in, on the YouTube channel of uh, Osawo. Uh, I, I am also grateful uh, Jakub Michalik for help, uh, who showed me uh, yesterday that uh, Kyle Kalgren uh, is still alive uh, on uh, YouTube uh, and he creates uh, some value and smart uh, videos, as you will see in the end, uh, uh, in the end of this uh, lecture. So, let's uh, get started. Everyone on the planet uh, is uh, familiar with the bold capital S inside the characteristic diamond shape. Superman, inseparable from the US and its values, 
has become a, an icon we still remember thanks uh, to film and television productions. Still, the times of uh, relativism and existential crisis uh, of the West have made the legend slowly fade away. The character uh, traverses from being a hero to a crystal clear concept, not so much unsurpassed, but rather a naive one. Superman no longer convinces or inspires. He appears to be insignificant, a cardboard cutout. He is not taken seriously even as a comic book or a cartoon character. Superman <coughs> is completely disconnected from our daily lives, where nothing is easy to accomplish, where being straightforward does not reward anyone. Was not Jesus Christ treated similarly when he talked about turning the other cheek with humility? Among all superheroes raging our cinemas, amusement centers, and TV sets, it was the Man of Steel who set the standards for this particular generation of characters. Indeed, he was the pop culture version of Zeus and Moses, mixed together, made suitable for the 20th century. If not for the first appearance of the Man of Steel in the first edition of Action Comics in the summer of 1958, there would not be uh, a new pantheon, a pantheon of superheroes equipped with superpowers busy saving humanity. The last survivor from planet Krypton spawned in the imagination of two friends, Joe Shuster and Jerry Siegel, Jews from a small town of Cleveland. They told a story about an exceptional child sent to Earth while his native planet was about to explode. But the story was created not only to achieve success during the hard times of the Great Depression. Above all else, the authors were telling a story about themselves about the generation of emigrants on which the greatest of the U.S. was built. Superman is a great representation of dreams and aspirations of people trying to break the glass ceiling, people no one cares about or supports. When we read the Peace Adventures of Kal-El, his original name from Krypton, we realized that Superman's main trouble was not alien invasions of paranormal activity. He started off by defending truth and justice, caring for the well-being of ordinary people. There was no accident in Superman becoming an icon and the object of worship among readers and the public opinion. An innovative approach to the rogue character and making him wear red and blue tights was not all there was to it. Generally, Schuster and Siegel perfectly understood the challenges of being a laborer and an emigrant. It turned out that cheap paperback Superman comic books were most popular among the children from these two social groups. These kids immediately took uh, the clumsy Clark hands, hopelessly in love with Lois Lane, his friend from the Daily Planet newsroom. He was not exactly torn by the romantic feelings, rather disturbed by an inner identity conflict. Being an outsider from space and living behind a facade in order to form a part of human society. 
there lies the common uh, conflict of interest between the role accepted by other people and the attitudes uh, reflecting one's own true pursuits and dreams. Sadly, one is often different from the other, something that Sigmund Freud masterly depicted in the nauseous civilization and its discontents. All in all, Superman is a creation characteristic of a kid's imagination confronting the challenges of an adult life, the way a kid would feel like facing this in a dream reality. The Man of Tomorrow stories where Superman defends the order in Metropolis and engages in supporting American soldiers in World War II made, made a, a great difference in American publishing industry. He quickly made his way to the urban popular culture on the other side of the Atlantic, visible in American fairs, heard on radio programs, and soon watched it in a leading TV series. From the following 20 years, Superman set the tone and the framework of reference for science and fantasy novels, changing these genres significantly. Nevertheless, the socialistic aspects of the first Superman stories disappeared in mid-40s. After Schuster and Siegel, the very creators of the hero, lost the copyright lawsuit over the use of Superman as a fictional character. Uh, just like the figure with Batman character uh, in the same time. As a result, Kal-El was taken over by stories favored by the establishment, full of patriotism and appre appreciation for the American values. Since then, the comic book focus in a ring around the rosy manner, around the same Dems and topics, enormous dangers, monsters, crazy <coughs> scientists, awkward technology, and being hopelessly in love with clever lawyers. The real trouble started for Superman in 1962. That year, Stanley made his great entry with the Fantastic Four idea through Marvel Publishing Company. Together with Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby, Lee reformulated the concept of a superhero, letting it evolve from the golden era of comic book art into more modern medium, able to reflect the inner life of youth and adults, not only kids. The storyline would appear in real life locations, usually, usually large cities like New York, San Francisco, and other big metropolises of the United States. The main characters had more complex psychological traits and a tangled um, emotional life, often pushing them towards existentialism. The vices and weaker sides of superheroes did not make them more courageous or charismatic, but it made them much more human. DC Comics, the owner of uh, the Superman character and his universe, reacted to the new competition by parroting the new ideas rather than strength Jenning uh, the traditional approach or creating an actual response, response, response to Marvel's new concept. The old publisher chased creators who once worked for Marvel, just like Jack, uh, Jack Kirby. You can see his cover right here of Superman Expo, uh, the new Jimmy Olsen. Um, asking them to shape characters similarly 
while working for DC Comics as soon as the contracts with the competitor expired. But Kirby and his followers did not have much to say about reshaping the Man of Steel. Editors for DC made it impossible for them. Today, thanks to the significant time perspective, we can see that the owners of the publishing house locked Superman in a prison of stereotypes. Best-selling comic book artists and screenwriters were not allowed to work freely on their ideas and the characters that resulted from that approach did not make it to the canon of comic book characters. Their impact was rarely felt in the long term run. For that reason, Superman did not provoke as many interpretations as, say, Batman or Spider-Man. The publishing house did not treat Superman like a flesh and blood character, but la rather like a brand name. He did not get a chance to go through the changes shaped by trends and personal tastes. The stranger from Krypton does not have a psychological death, does not suffer from inner conflict, commonly human life, which allows the character to advance, modify its behavior or image. Superman basically does not evolve. He is still a simple American citizen who grew up on a farm in Kansas. That is where he learned the wisdom of the cycle of life and its simplicity. DC followed and copied the ideas published by Marvel well into the 80s. That is when stories overreaching several books and parallel series became a thing. With the New interest in dark mature things uh, it, introduced by screenwriters from the United Kingdom, just like Alan Moore, Grant Ennis, Jamie Delano, who then invaded the American market in 1986. It somewhat would tell you that it was a year or two years earlier, uh, while uh, Cabal 3000 was published by DC Comics by Brian Boland. Nevertheless, DC Comics made a brand new offensive. There was no more room for optimism, bliss and light. The publishing house became more interested in political thrillers, where the main characters acted not exactly like saints, but rather presented all kinds of psychological issues, manias included. The atmosphere of nuclear apocalypse, the fear caused by the Cold War, made the authors more concerned with the psyche of villains and anti-villains, their characters and their opposites than with no enforcement officers, callers to the bone. Moral rel relativism took its toll also on the Superman character. Although it is difficult to talk about any good change in this particular case, some of the elements uh, from the authors were trying to introduce just did not feel fit very well. In The Dark Knight Returns, Man of Steel is depicted as a Pavlov dog of President Reagan, the secret weapon of the U.S. Army during the Cold War, especially a, a conflict in Vietnam. The success of this series caused certain ideas more fitting for the so-called cinema of moral anxiety make their way into the mainstream superhero comic books. In this series about Clark Kent, this new trend was grotesque, <coughs> to say the least. 
John Berg tried to save the legend of Superman between the late 80s and early uh, 90s by the, the Man of Steel series, creating an interpretation which still prevails as the one having married once and forever. Even so, this effort did not help Superman bring the sales DC Comics wanted him to bring. Determined to make profit, DC Comics decided to start a marathon of modifications that smelled of desperation rather than a strategy. The publisher started off by killing the father of generation of our superheroes by a huge monster called Doomsday in the death of Superman's storyline. Then revived him again in the return of Superman's story to bifurcate him into two characters with a strong electromagnetic field and place him in the middle of some mega epic adventures. These strategies did not achieve much in the way of changing Superman's status quo. They rather undermined the very genre of a superhero story by making death mean nothing in the storylines of mainstream comic art. If Clark Kent can be revived just like that, then every superhero can die and come back again in full glory. Comic books became repetitive and predictable, so people soon became bored of them, neglecting the comic art more and more. Right now the pigs are as bad as can be. Current Superman comic book sales in the US fell below 60,000 copies. Uh, there is a connection between uh, Superman mythos and unnecessary shame nowadays. Over the last 20 years, DC Comics tried to make Superman more attractive by retelling the story of his origin. No other superhero has been subject to so many origin rated pretensions with varying results. From today's perspective, only two stories stood the test of time. In the first one, All-Star Superman by Grant Morrison and Frank Quietly, the authors collected the best elements from the Man of Steel series. In that run, we witnessed several stories concerning Superman's final days where he attempts to finalize some of his affairs before passing away. Superman behaves like a fully fledged human being, with some emphasis on, on curtain changes wrought by feminists and caused by the crisis of manhood. One phenomenon, phenomenon in a way connected with the other. As you can see uh, what's going on on this panel, uh, this is the famous page from the Old Star Superman where this golf girl tries to make a suicide and Superman in the last moment saves her and says something like that you are much stronger girl than you think you are, trust me. And on the right you can see the version of this scene directed by Zack Snyder. So, uh, the second one is a bird by Stephen T. Siegel and Teddy Christensen. Uh, the best Superman comic book without Superman is targeted at ma mature readers in the comic book a promising screenwriter is asked to write a couple of screenplays for a newspaper 
with a capital letter S on its cover. His deliberations push him into asking questions about the role Superman plays in contemporary <coughs> culture, how it betrays our fears and desires, reflects our simple disputes and family drama. While working on the assignment, the screenwriter faces difficult relationship with his brother and his dying father, with whom he did not have much in common when he was younger. This is some panels from the ordinary uh, Superman story from the 90s. Uh, I don't quite remember which kind of story, unfortunately. Right now, um, Right now, uh, DC Comics is trying to tell the story of Clark Kent through a miniseries called Superman American Alien. This series does not concentrate on the incomer from Krypton, but rather his social facade and alter ego, Clark Kent. The authors show how Clark did not become a bitter and weak person, even though his youth and adulthood was filled with weak, weak, weakness caused by the other people, intolerant towards him being different. The feeling of being an outsider of the alienation are supposed to reflect the feelings Muslims immigrants incre increasingly shared in the USA and uh, Europe. These issues have always been visible in Superman's homeland, America. Right now, uh, I want you to show some video with Max Landis, who is the uh, uh, who is the writer of the mini series called American Alien. Uh, he's the son of director John Landis, who maybe you know from such music videos as The Thriller by Michael Jackson. I'm just going to go for a minute. I wanted to say this. I stopped myself from tweeting it. Tell me when. So hi, I've expressed a lot of opinions on Superman online, and this is because the character means a tremendous amount to me. I value clarity uh, in character a lot because I feel that character drives story. Um, movies where story drives story don't usually interest me. I, I much prefer something like uh, a Reservoir Dogs to something like an Italian Job because plot has never really fascinated me. Character does. And people talk about Superman as boring. I, in my short film, which some of you guys might have seen, say nobody gives a fuck about Superman. You don't give a fuck about Superman, even if you think you do. And that's because I don't feel like, it's not because I think people don't give a fuck about him. He's the world's most enduring, or enduring superhero outside of maybe Hercules. Um, it's more that no one gets what's special about Superman um, in a pop way. What's special about Superman is that his parents didn't fucking die. He's not a selfish, post-traumatic sissy who needed to have his parents shot to death in front of him to understand that maybe you should help people and that crime is wrong and murder is bad. His Uncle Ben didn't need to be killed basically at his own hand to drive the point home that if you have superpowers, you should use them to help people. He didn't get stranded on a desert island. He didn't have a ring forced upon him that brought him into an intergalactic police force. He wasn't raised by Amazons. He didn't go up on a ship and get irradiated. He's just a guy from Kansas who has the best superpowers. He's unstoppable. And instead of absolute power corrupting absolutely, absolute power has absolved him from fear and greed and hate and all of the weaknesses that stem from human insecurity. What's special about Superman is that he will always make the right choice. That's what's unique about the character, is that he's not a genius. He doesn't have to be the most handsome guy in the world. Hell, John Cusack, I think, might have made a good Superman at one point, because all I want from that character is for him just to be a guy. 
Yes, he's an alien, but and yeah, his parents blew up on the planet. Oh, don't mind the planet's core, it'll become unstable. But he doesn't know that till he's freaking 19. Like, he just spends all this time going, holy crap, I keep knocking things over. And that's kind of wonderful, right? That's special. That's better than a narcissistic bully like Spider-Man or a cold sociopath like Batman, a egomaniac like Reed Richards. You're looking at someone who's a superhero because being a superhero makes the most sense. You can either try to save the world or you can take it over. If you're a Kryptonian on Earth, those are your options. And he chooses why not try to save it. So I saw Man of Steel last night. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I'm in the industry and you know, it's, I see how movies like that happen. It's very beautiful. In it, Superman, spoiler alert, click pause, spoiler alert. Superman takes part in two of the largest disaster scenes I've ever seen in a movie. Uh, and I'm not talking about like, oh, well, what about Day After Tomorrow? What about Day Independence Day? Those are movies that are based around disaster scenes. I go into a movie like 2012 to see a city be destroyed. You know where a city shouldn't be being destroyed? In the fucking Superman movie. <laughs> And, and I kind of loved the way it looked when it was getting destroyed, but Superman shouldn't be allowing that to happen. People get mad because he kills Zod at the end. Again, I said spoilers, he snaps his neck because Lord knows those four people in that train station had to be saved after hundreds of thousands of people have died on camera in a, such direct 9-11 corollaries that I was sort of, I kind of made this face during the movie. Because it was like, wow, they showed the building fall and the smoke and the people falling out. It was like, Wow. Um, what it comes down to is that I don't mind if Superman kills people because he has no reason not to kill people. I know one of the tenets of the character is that he doesn't, but the reason he doesn't is because having that much power makes you responsible for weaker people. Superman, when he's fighting you, isn't like Batman. He also isn't like Spider-Man, who will bully you and make fun of his villains. You think, why do you think Spider-Man's villains all hate him so much? Maybe because as he breaks their bones, he's mocking them. Batman's villains are all insane. Superman, when he goes after someone, is essentially not trying to beat them. He's trying to save them from themselves. He doesn't want to have to kill them. He's freaking Superman, so he probably could do it pretty quickly. You think Lex Luthor is going to do much with a gun or in a fist fight to a Kryptonian? His skin is diamond hard. He can move faster than the speed of sound. You're looking at a god that walks amongst men. You're really the parasite. Oh, I'm shaking in my boots. The atomic man. Oh, gosh. How are these guys going to stop Superman? They're not. They're not. The only... They had to create Mr. Mixelplick in order to find a character that could effectively fuck with Superman. But when he's fighting someone like Zod, that scenario of him allowing Zod to basically destroy all of Metropolis while he attempts to beat him in a punching contest, and then he's forced to kill him, I have to believe, and comic book fans... You can shit all over me, because I know a lot of people are mad that he killed Zod in the movie. I have to believe that Superman would try to kill Zod almost immediately if the alternative to Zod being dead was 150,000 people dying. You want to know why? Because he's not responsible for Zod. Superman's sense of, in, not entitlement, but responsibility comes from the fact that he is an adult walking amongst children. Humans can't be as good as he can be. Zod, on the other hand, is another adult. And if one adult in the room says, I'm going to kill all the others, it shouldn't be a city-destroying sequence. It should be two guys fighting in space or on the moon. He should stop him. Watching that city die reminded me of Transformers 3 or like the end of Avengers. Everything ends in the same city-destroying pandemonium terrorist attack from space. Everything gets leveled and all of these people die. And then in the next scene, that guy, uh, you know, it's like, hey, you want to go to a baseball game? No, the teams are all dead. Why are we in this office? I guess what I'm saying isn't so much an opinion on the Man of Steel. It's more about the way superhero movies have become. I wrote a superhero movie. It's called Chronicle. It is ultimately viewed as a superhero movie. I didn't think of it as that. I thought it was a sci-fi dramatic thriller when I was writing it that used tenets of superhero stuff that I love 
because I'm not above superhero movies, but it used the stuff that I love to tell a story we hadn't really told outside of Akira and Carrie. At the end of Chronicle, there's a big rampage. Maybe 17 people die, maybe $20 million of property damage. But you know the two people who are fighting, you know why they're doing what they're doing, and that's Josh Trank being great at directing, that's, you know, and that's Dane and Dane and Alex being really good actors, and, you know, I think I did a pretty good job with the script. At the end of Superman, and at the end of a lot of these movies, all I'm seeing is fire and death. And that confuses the living shit out of me. Because everybody's going to these movies, and they're all making so much money. And at the end, a hero stands tall as all of society has crumbled behind him. That isn't a superhero to me, a guy who stands there after everyone else is dead. That's like a rock star. That's really hot. I don't want to see movies about rock stars. But the hero back in the superhero movies, because I think super might have taken over. Cut. <laughs> you don't give a fuck about your rating. Okay, uh, I also recommend to watch on YouTube uh, his speech of retelling uh, the death of Superman. It's a uh, 50 minutes uh, video long. It's very interesting and uh, very, very thrilling. Mm. Uh, but uh, returning to our lecture, it is clear that DC Comics has a serious problem with Superman. Instead of telling new intriguing <coughs> stories about the hero from Krypton, the publisher plays the same song over and over, the story of Superman's origin. There is a subtle trap in that one may start to believe that the Man of Steel cannot de develop as a character since the beginning, the hero does not have any weaknesses or personality traits which could be used to shape him further. But maybe the main focus should not be Superman himself, but rather people he meets. Could these uh, other characters be perfect, have messier biographies? What we see looks more as if the screenwriters and comic artists were trying to make excuses for Superman being awkwardly omnipotent, like in a miniseries now published in the USA called The Dark Knight 3, The Master Race, by Frank Miller and Brian Azzarello. From him being a simple, honest guy from Kansas, who cares about a good man when anti-heroes or villains are much sexier? Where to look for the shades of grey, something that could interest a more seasoned reader? All it takes to realize that Superman is not special because of his goodness, generosity, and limitless power. The strength, the strength of that fictional character is the awareness of responsibility of his shoulders. Bob Dylan once said, a hero is someone who understands the responsibility that comes with his freedom. <coughs> These words sum up Clark Kent very well. While Batman is driven by trauma, resentment, or, or even vengeance, Superman is driven by taking action. Putting it, uh, putting it simple, who we have there is a God who prefers the remain human and save humanity to make it better. He is a lighthouse, a role model, a leader, not one who judges and falls into the pit of existentialism, particularly with the current Western civilization, its manias and phobias. 
while I was preparing for this lecture, I thought about some problems with millennials. And here I would like to show you a commentary of famous uh, journalist from the USA, which name is Alexis Bloomer. If you guys have anyone on your social media like I do, that's over the age of 40, um, you've probably seen the post at some point about how much our generation sucks. Well, as a millennial, I took it upon myself to try to evaluate what's so wrong with our generation and why they're so mad at us. And then I pretty much realized that we're just existing. We're not really contributing anything to society. Our generation doesn't have the basic manners that include no ma'am and yes ma'am. We don't even hold the door open for ladies, much less our elders anymore. We listen to really obscene music that degrades women and pretty much glorifies drugs and crime. We start to cuss now to prove a point. We use words like they to describe someone we love. And we idolize people like Kim Kardashian and then we shame people like Tim Tebow. We're lazy, we're really entitled, and we want to make a lot of money and have free education, but we're not really willing to put in the work. We spend more time online making friends and less time actually building relationships. And our relationships appearance on Facebook is more valuable than the foundation that it's actually built on. Our idea of standing up for something we believe in means going on Facebook and posting a status with your opinion. And we believe the number of followers we have reflects who we are as a person. We don't respect our elders. We don't even respect our country. We're stepping on our flag instead of stepping up to volunteer. And we mock the men and women that are fighting for us, but we praise the people that are fighting each other, guys. We're more divided as a country than ever before. And I think our generation actually has a lot to do with that. Everything that used to be frowned upon is now celebrated. Nothing has value in our generation because we take advantage of everything. We have more opportunities to succeed than any of those before us, yet we don't appreciate the opportunities we have now. Now I guess I see why people call us Generation Y. Like, why are we so entitled? Because we don't deserve to be, and we were raised better than this. I think that our generation, I always wonder what we're gonna be remembered by, and I, for one, wanna break that stereotype and prove that my parents raised me better, don't you? To all of our elders, I'm sorry, and I do know that we were raised better. Thank you from this millennial for putting up with those and those who do not see wrong in their actions. I hope we start pulling our pants up and actually contributing to the society we love and maybe make a difference in 2016, so that we can make a difference in the future. Maybe a character with values like Superman can help a success in a world where there is no values or they are not popular enough. Fortunately, the role of DC Comics in creating the myth of Superman is limited by the <coughs> activities of numerous uh, enthusiasts. Their bottom-up projects and online initiatives like fan films, fan comics, and uh, fan illustrations on deviant art. For them, the capital S does not follow from the movies or comic books, but rather from understanding the underlying concept and symbolism by their parents and friends. Let us hope that this idea will not shrink and be reduced to consumerism and that it will not fade like Che Guevara's face on a t-shirt. We should not forget that this old but vital character has still plenty of positive, motivating vibes. And at the end of this lecture, I would like to show a video created by Kyle Calgren, which was created uh, three weeks ago. And Action Comics number one. First printed June of 1938. The cover. A being, ostensibly human, holds a car above his head. No words other than the title. No hint of this fantastic being's identity. There's no suggestion that the people running scared are terrified citizens or fleeing evildoers. There is only a single incredible display of strength. This was the character's first introduction in the form of image. When he's introduced in text, the incantation to summon him traditionally has four speakers. One imperative sentence, excitedly broken into fragments, then a quick sequence of three structurally matched declarative sentences, all attempting to describe an undefined 
third party. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's... Since his earliest forms, we've been instructed to look up in awe. Now, it's a bit of a cliche in this context to quote 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, especially his oft-repeated, little-understood declaration, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. But it's necessary to understand his concept of the Übermensch. In a godless universe, that is, a universe devoid of higher laws granted from a divine source, morality would come from a theoretical individual able to overcome or transvalue their values and serve as a liberating creative force, creating a new order of rank by embodying meaning, by being what Nietzsche called the meaning of the earth. The concept of the Übermensch is often linked to this character owned by DC Comics, because the most common English translation of Übermensch is Superman. But there are problems with that connection. First, Übe in German denotes something is above or over something else, while super in English implies high quality. Overman is a close translation. Second, mensch is gender neutral. Superman implies that this higher human has to be male and excludes Übermenschen who are women or otherwise non-binary. And thirdly, the Übermensch is human, the highest form of human. It's a more fitting label for someone like Lex Luthor, or at least the way he sees himself. Feel that, Kent. Real muscle. Not the gift of alien biochemistry, the product of hard work. But Superman? This amazing stranger from the planet Krypton came from a race of Superman, sent down from the heavens to be raised as a human. Like Moses, a child sent in a basket from a dying family. Like Hercules, a strong man with the blood of Olympians. Like Apollo, beautiful, rational, and inexorably linked to the sun. And like Jesus Christ, they only let the light to show the way. For this reason above all, their capacity for good. I have sent you, my only son. Superman can't be the Übermensch, because Superman is a god. I am far from the first or last person to notice this. It was that divine connection that would inspire later comics writers to appropriate old gods for the comic page, then create new ones, then deconstruct the very idea of the god. Of course, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster set the standard for all superheroes to follow in many ways. Powers, costume, secret identity, the very prefix of super. The children of Jewish immigrants from Europe, Siegel and Schuster created a symbol of the individual's power over the system, written during a time when the individual was most devalued. It's telling them his first enemies were robots, Nazis, forces of tyrannical dehumanization. Defeated by the sheer impossibility of Superman's presence. But that's the supposed problem with Superman's character. He's not human. He's too powerful. His abilities make him unrelatable. Everything's too easy for him. He's not like, say, Batman, a normal man who pushed himself into becoming extraordinary. He sets an ideal we can never reach. He is mocking us just by being who he is. Think of the children who read his stories. How can they respect the hard-working mother, father, or teacher who's so pedestrian, trying to teach them the common rules of conduct, wanting her to kick her feet on the ground and unable to even figuratively fly through the air? Psychologically, Superman undermines the authority and dignity of the ordinary man and woman in the minds of children. That was a quote from Dr. Frederick Wortham, from his tome, Seduction of the Innocent. He successfully lobbied for the censorship of American comic books and helped turn Superman from a futurist power play into a silly, cartoonish, domestic farce, where his greatest threat wasn't Lex Luthor or Brainiac, but marriage to Lois Lane. That was comics code Superman, revamped for the patriarchal atmosphere of the 1950s, where a man's greatest enemy was often woman. I mean to say that you've been married for her for 15 years? Yeah, 15 years! And they call me Superman. Ugly sexism, but it inadvertently hits on part of Superman's appeal. Just like the apostles who chronicled the life of Christ, 
His human companions are the way into the supposedly unrelatable Superman. Kryptonite isn't his only weakness. His heart is human. And he's made more human by his circle of friends. Mon Pa Kent, his pal Jimmy Olsen, and the most important perspective in the Superman stories, that of Lois Lane. Easy, miss. I've got you. You, you got me? Who's got you? Richard Donner understood this well. In this long take, Superman leaves Lois after a magical flight through the city. Superman. And then Lois answers the door, and in walks bumbling, awkward Clark Kent. In many ways, Lois is us. She loves Superman, only tolerates Clark. She loves the super, ignores the man. The most beautiful two-person love triangle in fiction. In his book, Super Gods, comics writer Grant Morrison thought that Clark Kent was the masterstroke of Siegel and Schuster's creation. In his own words, Clark was the soul, the transcendent element in the Superman equation. Clark was proof that Superman could be us. He is God made flesh. He is the living spark of divinity in all of us. Just by turning and shedding our exterior selves, we could disappear into a streak of red and blue and perform the fantastic. Through the eyes of Lois, we look up in wonder. Through the eyes of Clark, we look in with pride. But Clark, over time, got just as many deconstructions as Superman. Here's a famous one. And what are the characteristics of Clark Kent? He's weak. He's unsure of himself. He's a coward. Clark Kent is Superman's critique on the whole human race. In this reading, Clark is seen as a pretension of Superman's, God's parody of a human. And without that human element, we could only look up. Despite the name, Superman is more Immanuel Kant than Friedrich Nietzsche, Kant being one of the chief theorists of deontological ethics, that is, ethics which emphasize the goodness of the act. He famously created the concept of the categorical imperative, a principle of moral duty, restating the golden rule for secular age. In his words, I ought never to act except in such a way that I could also will that my maxim should become a universal law. It's worth noting that Nietzsche hated Kant. Again, Superman can't be an Ubermensch. Ubermensch transcend law. Superman embodies law. And Superman's law? Superman fights a never-ending battle for truth and justice. A never-ending battle for truth and justice implies that truth and justice are universal concepts that one can serve. Categorical imperatives. So, Superman can be viewed as deontologically moral. Oh, Superman. He is good because he performs good acts in good will. And he never willingly performs bad acts. Superman embodies older notions of ethics, of imperatives that exist a priori, above human experience, brought down from heaven or from Krypton. Perhaps that's why in the 80s, it was easy to see the Blue Boy Scout operating as a symbol of American military power, gone from overcoming authority to acting as authority. Here come the planes. Is there American planes? Made in America. The super had finally overtaken the man. Superman's idea was too powerful, his canon too sacred, that no one could even attempt to dissect him without him dying during the operation. Even killing him made him more godlike. After all, he died and then had risen. This tabula rasa for reader's ideal self slowly became overwritten. This being born of motion became too solid. So writers over the years made dummy Superman. Reflections, dissections, parodies, and perversions of Siegel and Schuster's Son of Krypton. In DC Comics, Bizarro, Ultraman, Eradicator, in Marvel, Hyperion, Blue Marvel, The Sentry, in Image Comics, Supreme, Omni-Man, in Wildstorm, Apollo, Mr. Majestic, Mark Wade's The Plutonian, Garth Ennis's The Homelander, Kurt Busiek's Samaritan, all attempts to understand this ever more archaic idea. Where does that goodness come from? He simply couldn't be 
good. But that's the truth of his character. Superman is good. Superman is a symbol more than he is a character. He accepts without question that it is his duty to perform virtuous acts. But such a view might be anathema to Nietzschean morality. Nietzsche once wrote, a virtue must be our invention. It must spring out of our personal need and defense. In every other case, it is a source of danger. That which does not belong to our life menaces it. What destroys a man more quickly than to work, think, and feel without inner necessity, without any deep personal desire, without pleasure, as a mere automaton of duty? Maybe that's why Superman seems unrelatable, simply because our views of morality have shifted. We can't accept an idea of good that comes from outside of human perception. The individual is stronger than ever before. We find our own truth, our own justice, our own way. We are more connected, more scrutinous of others, more aware of our own capabilities as individual actors. We are all little ubermenschen in our own way. That isn't to say that this view is wrong or immoral, not at all. It's simply different, perhaps more nuanced, and maybe more fit for our world today than the one that birthed Superman. After 75 years of oscillating between god and demigod, we decided that we prefer human heroes. Superman isn't an ubermensch, but we so desperately want him to be. It's not that we can't believe a man can fly. We can't even believe that a man can know that it's wrong to kill. And I was like, I really feel like we should kill Zod, and I really feel like Superman should kill him. Not in the why of it was for me, I go, it's truly an origin story. His aversion to killing is unexplained. It, it's just in his DNA, and I felt like we needed him to do something, just like him putting on the glasses or going to the Daily Planet, or any of the other things that you're sort of seeing for the first time that you realize will then become sort of his thing. And he's just like, I can't. How can I kill ever again? Superman is dead. Superman remains dead. And we have killed him. If someone wants to know uh, really good Superman stories, uh, some of them uh, were translated in Polish. There is a Polish version of Star Superman, for example, uh, Kingdom Come, Superman for All Season. Nevertheless, if someone uh, wants uh, to read some bright, shiny, and smart Superman story, I recommend you uh, to read Action Comics uh, 775 by Joe Kelly, which calls what's about, uh, what's so funny about uh, True Justice at American Way. It's very short but powerful story that uh, inspire, can inspire you to fight cynicism in today's world. Uh, also, if there uh, would be a question, uh, if someone would uh, like to send me a message, here is my email at my website, gotabitdirain. And if someone have uh, any questions to this uh, lecture? Maybe you will answer these questions you can see on the wall. Why it's hard to appreciate the simple mixture of goodness in today's world. Why we like 
so much uh, badass characters at the heroes. Even villains, the Suicide Squad film will be released very soon. Excuse me? Because we get bored. We get bored of the same goodness that we see in every single superhero and every single comic. That's why we enjoy Joker. That's why we enjoy uh, The Winter Soldier. That why, that's why we enjoy any superhero turning villain, villainous or any, um, I don't know, superhero having doubts. And or or not even heroes. That's what we enjoy villains because mm -hmm. people enjoy being um, seen, not just being entertained, but also but that in a in a big way. But also uh, seeing something that they see in themselves. So no human is is alternately is just ultimately good. Mm -hmm. So believing that there could be someone like Superman is just highly unlikely for everyone around. That's why we okay. prefer to believe that there are heroes like Batman or heroes like, um, I don't know, Iron Man, who's an alcoholic. I mean, yeah, that's a human thing, right? Mm -hmm. Batman's kind of, you know, psycho and, and he's yeah. weird and he's a womanizer. And that's also, that's a human trait. That's a human flaw. That's why we enjoy he heroes that are not perfect, or was, villains, because we understand them more. He was played by Christian Bale, who previously played uh, in American Psycho, which perfectly fits to these two characters. You, please? Yeah, I wanted to say that maybe our generation just didn't experience enough evil to have the need for the goodness. Because it's been a while for us, and I mean, yeah, so we don't feel the need, and we don't see it believable maybe and just yeah just that maybe we don't experience enough during like our times right now <coughs> here in Europe and I just want to add well my personal favorite speaker is Batman and it's it's uh, already it's a, a cliche that most people say that they like Batman because uh, he's human he's uh, relatable and so on but Actually, the, the reason, and of course, the, 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 famous, the famous retort to every argument because I'm Batman, because he's Batman. But actually, the reason why I like him so much and why so many people like him so much, why so many people like all these uh, flawed uh, heroes and uh, anti heroes, mm -hmm. is because uh, despite their flaws, they are, uh, they are still mm -hmm. uh, trying to fight. Like, uh, that's what uh, the existentialists uh, believe in. That uh, despite uh, despite the futility of uh, uh -huh. of our struggles, uh, we we still we, we still uh, go on, keep on living. We still want to, want to fight. We still want to be better. And that's actually what may, what makes us great. But can you agree with me that Batman is a weaker psychologically uh, character than Superman? Um, I, I, I mentioned it's hard to compare who is uh, psychologically better since Superman has basically n there is no psychological profile for Superman hardly. Uh, he's uh, he's supposed to be. This, but he uh, could forgive, man. like in speeding uh, bullets. Uh, it's an uh, as what story, which shows you what would uh, happen if the spaceship rocket with Superman uh, led in the way manner, and uh, Wayne's uh, raised up Kal-el, and he became uh, Bruce Wayne. And, uh, Story overall is medical. Lex Luthor turns Joker, Bruce Wayne becomes super bad. But at the end of the story, it's really fascinating me that uh, we, uh, this woman, which is mixing uh, Vicky Vale and Lois Lane, uh, 
make uh, Bruce Wayne turn up into delight to make him forgiving this traumatic events that make him uh, monster indeed because uh, but in in uh, in this food in fundaments of Batman character is self-hatred. Batman hates himself because he can't help his parents while they need it. I believe you can find all these things in Batman stories as well. It all depends uh, on the writer. Many people think that uh, Batman is... Uh, many people believe that Batman is uh, just a, a psychopath, uh, as, just as dangerous as, as his villains, that there is no light to him. But uh, there are stories like uh, uh, Scott Snyder's uh, his whole Batman run, especially Death of the Family, where Batman actually, uh, it is acknowledged uh, that Batman is still human thanks to his extended family, his uh, Robins, uh, Batgirl, Alfred, and uh, also you should, uh, okay, are you I'm sure you're familiar with the, the 90s uh, series by Bruce Timm and uh, all the the animated yes, series. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see in many episodes that uh, Batman is trying to, is actually very often trying to help, uh, help uh, the criminals that he's chasing. For example, there is this great episode, It's Not Too Late, where he actually yes. help, helps uh, this uh, elderly gangster to rehabilitate himself. Uh, he's also trying to... I agree with you with one thing. Uh, if you think you are a good writer, show me your way you will depict the Superman. Because a good writer can write a good Superman story. And that is incredibly hard to make nowadays. Yeah, there are also many, many stories in which uh, Superman seems almost like uh, Batman. <coughs> Zack Snyder's movies. <laughs> Who saw uh, the latest movie, Batman Dawn of Batman. Justice? What do you think about it? Um, yes. I think it was actually pretty good. Like in the in, in the way Batman was represented, that was really uh, really good. But well, the thing about Superman is that well, he. He um, maybe sees himself as kind of above the law, right? But he, he can't be above the law because he, because he is a part of community, a part of this country. But his actions and um, the way he chooses to do them, like, I don't want to spoil anything for um, anyone, but, yes. uh, well, they are clearly above the law. And there, there, here rises the problem, right? How, what to do with it? Uh, because uh, not everyone see this movie. Um, uh, I will cut this discussion because uh, um, hmm, everyone should wait for the director cut version four hours long, as it intended to be. Maybe it will be watchable. So, uh, any questions? Any more questions? If no, thank you very much. And, uh, please visit my website.